1920s West Texas was booming. And in Midland, that growth could be seen for miles. The tall city got its name as skyscrapers started to pop up seemingly out of nowhere. In 1928, business was booming too. Midland established downtown Rotary and Lions Clubs that are still active today. <laughs> Farmers were given money by the state to fight off pink bollworm. The infestation eventually caused the state to act. The 3,000 people that called Midland home were all centered around Midland's main industry, oil and gas. Prices dipped below $1.20, the lowest it had been throughout the decade. For a community dependent on the oil industry, there was a worry in the air, but it wouldn't last long. A rebound going into 1929 caused more moves across the tall city. The Hogan Building opened in July and the Scarborough Hotel followed right after. Some say this signified big business and changes coming to what was a sleepy cattle town. As hotels started to create Midland skyline, businessmen moved in, converting their rooms into offices. And they had a lot to do. Magnolia Petroleum Company, now known as Exxon Mobil, was producing 6,000 barrels of oil a day. Conoco started buying up land across West Texas and 36 oil companies called Midland Home. But they needed to be entertained. Midland oil man T.S. Hogan opened the Yucca Theater that December. The first screening, Rio Rita. <laughs> Women started pouring into club rooms and even made strides to help others with the Midland Welfare Association. Elsewhere, life at the end of 1929 was not so grand. The stock market crash in October brought on Black Thursday, stocks fall by 11%. Black Monday, stocks fall by 13%, and Black Tuesday, where stocks fall another 12%. Unemployment had yet to catch up, and the newly elected President Herbert Hoover remained confident that the market would eventually rebound. What do the New Dealers propose to do with these unstable currencies, these unbalanced budgets, these debts, and these taxes? By March of 1930, more than 1.5 million Americans were unemployed. But that didn't hit Midland just yet. More than 8,000 people were living and working throughout the county. The demand for crude oil may have fallen. Production was still at a peak in the Permian Basin. However, prices were plummeting, hovering around $1 a barrel. This was not felt in the oil fields, nor on the local ranches. Many of them survived on leases, royalties, and rentals paid to them by big oil. 1930 was also the beginning of the Dust Bowl, given its name because of the sandstorms that swept across the south. The Dust Bowl was all caused by a drought. That same environmental struggle continued into the next year, bringing with it an infestation of pink bullworm. With no help from the state, farmers were forced to face that problem on their own. Midland struggled into 1931. Luckily, local organizations were able to step in and help. The Rotary Club held a fundraiser for those in need, collecting $4,000 in donations and breaking their record. The state of Texas also stepped in to help, establishing the Unemployment Relief Committee with a representative named in Midland. The next year, community gardens started to pop up, and with water from the fire department, vegetables became available for those in need. 1932 brought with it more struggles of the Great Depression. 1,000 people moved out, and rock bottom was hit. And with those people, oil companies also moved out of Midland, despite the establishment of the Texas Railroad Commission. The goal of the commission was to regulate oil demand across the state. This while the people of Midland struggled with high prices and high payments, including the Midland Welfare Association. In 1932, it reported a deficit of nearly $600 in groceries and more than $300 in medical bills. Midland was small, but was starting to see the effects of establishment. The city's first permanent resident, Herman Nelson Garrett, died in 1933. Those who were still living through the Great Depression were struggling for work. That year, the Midland Chamber of Commerce had a list of 350 men looking for work. Only one found a job. The drought was only worsening, and the infestation of the pink bullworm motivated farmers to go to the state's capital and fight for money to help the issue. 
With 30% of people asking for relief, the state of Texas designated Midland as a territory-wide relief distribution center. The oil field was starting to stabilize, and with that came higher oil prices, shooting up to 65 cents a barrel in 1934. The Oil and Gas Division of the Texas Railroad Commission was created, and new regulations and taxes were bringing more work back to Midland. Ten new oil fields were discovered within the Permian Basin. The Depression essentially ended. And in 1934, the fight against the pink bullworm came to a head. 200 farmers were reimbursed $500,000 for their costs. In the next year, the Great Depression in Midland finally came to an end. Humble Company picked up 70 houses and moved them to Midland for oil field workers. And they were working long, well-paid days in the 15 new oil fields discovered in 1934. Building permits reached an all-time low. As one Midland resident put it, Midland men had always had to be independent, and they learned a long time ago that the good times followed bad times.